When planning a tour, I try to amass all of the information possible and structure it in a 3x3 three three grid. Conditions, terrain, people. This method has three phases, tour planning, then in the mountains where I include my observations to make things more precise, all the way to the individual slope. But it is important that you study all three factors intensively during the tour planning stage. This includes the avalanche bulletin, which provides me with information about dangerous areas and snowpack structure, the weather report, which obviously provides me with a weather forecast, and then the map for terrain, a description of the tour, what I plan to do, and then of course, I should know who is coming with me, their ability, how motivated they are, and how the group works. When planning a tour, it is especially important to know what are the flexible components. I can't do anything about the weather or the snowpack, and the group is usually fixed, but I can pick and choose the tour destination, and that's what you have to keep in mind, that you need to find the right tour destination for the conditions and the group. When planning a tour in winter, the most important information is on the weather and the avalanche danger. When it comes to the weather, before you get too deep into it, into the factors contributing to avalanche risk, the first important thing is visibility. If we want to make decisions out there, we have to be able to see, and this is the first information I take from the weather report. And then comes the information about new snow, wind, or even a potential temperature increase in the snowpack, which are all closely linked to avalanche danger. No matter whether you use classic decision-making strategies or a completely modern approach, the Avalanche Bulletin always provides all the information you need to put the perfect tour into practice. This refers predominantly to the dangerous areas which can be found in the Avalanche Bulletin. And if you can avoid them, then of course you've done a big chunk right when it comes to reducing risks. The information in the Avalanche Bulletin is displayed in the form of a pyramid. At the top is the Avalanche Danger Level. This provides a general statement on how dangerous the forecast in the chosen region is. The compass rows and the elevation are also often provided for the avalanche prone locations where the danger is especially high. The avalanche problem tells us the characteristics of the danger on the slope, so how pronounced the danger on the slope is. On the next level, we find the information about the snowpack and the weather. There, more experienced users can find more detailed information about the current avalanche situation. When planning a tour, we get information about the terrain predominantly from maps or perhaps from guidebooks. Nowadays, there are numerous different maps. The digital age has arrived. We can find slope angle maps, maps that describe the typical avalanche terrain, even maps that describe the runout zone of potential avalanches. Nevertheless, a paper map is great for spreading out on the table in the cabin so so you can plan the next day and get a good overview of the tour area. Basically, the probability of an avalanche is naturally related to slope steepness. That is to say, we now have a scientifically proven crucial threshold. It's 30 degrees. That means avalanches occur on slopes over 30 degrees. Avalanches are very rare below 30 degrees. Then comes the avalanche danger level, which, simply put, states that the higher the danger level, the more dangerous it is, and the higher the probability of an avalanche being triggered. In the first step of tour planning, we want to blend the information we've taken from the Avalanche Bulletin with the information from the map, the information about the terrain. And the 30-degree method helps us do that. With the 30-degree method, we can identify cruxes along our route, a detailed assessment is important here. Once you have chosen a tour, the plan is at the stage where you can draw the lines you would like to travel along on the map using a pencil or on a digital map by setting waypoints using your mouse. 
You now need to identify the cruxes along this route, and the 30-degree method helps us do that. The first step of the 30-degree method is to identify all of the slopes with a steepness of 30 degrees or more, or that are located above the route as potential avalanche terrain. The second step is to look at all the slopes you have highlighted and remove the slopes that have not been identified in the Avalanche Bulletin as dangerous. In the next step, you can also remove the slopes that you will not be setting foot on, provided that you can judge whether spontaneous avalanches are unlikely and remote triggering is also unlikely. This means the slopes that are above the tour. We now want to perform a small risk assessment for every crux. Risk is hazard times consequences. That is our risk management system. This is always the path we follow out on the mountain and in planning. Now the only difference is that when planning, we have the avalanche bulletin to help us. This gives us a regional evaluation, but not yet a local evaluation, which we will conduct out in the mountains. So when it comes to danger, we use the danger level or slope angle to help us gauge whether the danger level will be high or low the next day when we set out on our tour. When it comes to consequences, we have four questions to answer, and it is exactly these four questions that we need to answer again later before descending an individual slope. Now, in this case, you once again work through the questions about the consequences. Therefore, the question, how big is the slope above me? Second question, how much snow can I expect? How much snow is there to bury me? And third question is, are there any terrain traps in the path of the avalanche? Will it propel me over rocks? Can I expect any pockets that will trap snow in the avalanche track or obstacles? And the fourth question is, how many people are exposed? That is to say, how many people are there in the dangerous area? Or can I choose safe assembly points or safety intervals? Only when the consequences are mild or the danger correspondingly low do we reach an acceptable level of risk. If this plan results in too high a risk, then naturally the advice is to immediately consider an alternative to these slopes if you have identified them during planning. In other words, you say, okay, the risk really is too high at the checkpoint, meaning the probability of avalanche release or the consequences. I want to have a plan B, so I can switch to plan B, and I'm not forced to bear this risk or break off the whole tour. In addition to the conditions and the tour destination, people and groups make up the third important factor that needs to be observed when planning a tour. All group members need to take a look at whether they have the right ability, fitness, and the motivation. Of course, everyone has to be in the fit enough for the length of the tour you're planning. It's no use if your destination is too ambitious and you lose half of the group along the way. You also need to have the appropriate skiing ability or walking technique and skiing skills for the ascent. This is a particularly important point when on demanding ascents and descents. And the third important factor is motivation, namely motivation in the sense that all group members have the same objective. The worst thing for a group is for everyone to have different expectations. The last thing to discuss when planning a tour is the necessary equipment. This refers to packing your backpack. Here, it is important that everyone in the group knows what they need to take with them, what group equipment is needed, and who is packing what. Of course, each individual has to take their own emergency equipment, namely avalanche transceiver, shovel, and probe. But group emergency equipment, such as a bivy bag and first aid, is also essential. Just before beginning the tour, things often get a bit hectic, and it would be good if everyone relaxes a bit, if you all go through the day's plan together one more time, if you all stick together, and of course, if you all stay together. Of course, when the avalanche transceiver check is being conducted at the beginning, the whole group should be together. However, the longer the tour, the more frequently the group gets separated. Alternatively, during planning, the group should already agree on rest points where they can meet up again and communicate. 
A golden rule when planning a tour is to have several destinations to choose from. If you only have one destination, then of course you have no flexibility. And dangerous situations are bound to occur. That means you pick a set of tours and then you pick the tour that best fits the conditions and the group on the day.